All right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the UVA Medical Center Hour. I'm Justin Mutter, director of our Medical Center Hour, which is a program of the UVA Center for Health Humanities and Ethics. We're delighted to bring you today's Brody Lecture as part of our Medical Education Week celebration here at UVA. And thanks to our, our live audience for joining us. Thanks to those of you who are on Zoom. And before I introduce our moderator, since this is a hybrid event, let me just say a few brief instructions about our question and answer session. Uh, following today's lecture. For those in our live audience, please just raise your hand if you have a question and a microphone will be brought to you. That way we can hear your question and our friends on Zoom uh, will be able to hear your question as well. Uh, for our Zoom audience, please enter your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen and those will be relayed to our speaker by our moderator. A reminder to everybody, uh, if you've got a handout on the way in, if you're here or on the slides on Zoom, you can claim continuing education credit for today's uh, participation and just follow the instructions um, on that handout or on the slides, which will appear again at the end of today's session. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Evan Heald. Dr. Heald is Associate Professor of, of Medicine and a longtime leader in undergraduate and graduate medical education here at UVA. He has practiced general internal medicine at University Medical Associates, advocating for the social mission of health professions education across the, the continuum of trainees' clinical experiences. As director of the Brody Medical Education Committee, Dr. Heald will introduce today's distinguished speaker. Evan. Great. Um, thanks, Justin, for that introduction. And now it's my turn to do a couple of introductions. Uh, I stand on the shoulders of Dr. Eugene Corbett, uh, who was the first director of the Brody Medical Education Fund Committee. Um, and this is Gene, uh, standing in front of the old medical school. On the other side of the slide is Mrs. Brody. Mrs. Brody was Gene's patient, um, a very grateful patient. Uh, she shared not only the intricacies of her life and her health issues, um, but uh, trusted Jean so much that she asked that he use the resources of her estate to make sure that there would be doctors like him in the future to take care of patients as he had cared with, as he had cared for her, to have the skills and the heart that he had had for her. Each year, the Brody Committee invites an external scholar to help us look at our educational systems and our programs critically. Dr. Corbett would say to stir ourselves, to stir ourselves to be better doctors, better educators, and better humans. This kind of thoughtful stirring is a reason that a spoon is on this slide as an important symbol for Mrs. Brody's work. It represents self-appraisal, and advocacy, layer after layer of iteration. This particular Brody spoon is carved from a poplar tree that was planted in the 1700s, a tree that still grows in Albemarle County. Think of the iteration it has witnessed. This year, we're pleased to be joined by Dr. Allison Huffstadler, She's the medical director of the Robert Graham Center for Policy Studies in Primary Care. She's an assistant professor of family medicine and population health at Virginia Commonwealth University and at fam uh, family medicine at Georgetown University. Dr. Hufstetter completed her family medicine residency here at UVA. Completed is a gross understatement. She was the 2018 Brody resident clinician and a Mulholland resident educator as well. She went on to a Robert L. Phillips Jr. Health Policy Fellowship at Georgetown University and currently teaches residents and students in her clinical practice in Fairfax. She has been remarkably productive and impactful in the short time since she was here at UVA. She's recognized nationally and internationally for her research in primary care and equity. Today, she will be teaching us about how to achieve social accountability in healthcare through graduate medical education. Dr. Huffstetler. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm really happy to be joining you as both a UVA alumni where I can come back and smell higher grounds and have a treat coffee than remember the ways that I made it through my very long residency days, but also to talk to you about a really important topic that I'm looking forward to our discourse on and that is graduate medical education. Before I jump in, I do want to tell you a little bit about the Graham Center. We are in DC and our mission is to fuel research that helps engage primary care and communities. We wanna promote health equity and we wanna support primary care through evidence and its evidence base. One thing that's really important about the Graham Center is it is the only academy affiliated research center in the United States. And we are autonomous. We have our own editorial independence. So when I publish a negative study about family medicine, it's okay. And when I publish null studies about family medicine, it's okay, because that's what drives change in our communities. So when other organizations have tried to do this, it's all about the positive, but I will frame to you today that we have to look at our weaknesses to be able to build in the GME community and in primary care. There are two really neat things about the Graham Center that I think you all would be interested in. And that is we have a one-year fellowship for post-trainees. And this can be any time after your residency, one year after or 10 years after. You spend a year with us in DC, you have continuity clinic and 70% dedicated research time. And we give you all the tools you need from the basics if you've never done research to letting you fly on your own by the end of the year. So it's a really fabulous endeavor. But if you can't do a full year with us, we also have a one month Larry A. Green visiting scholars program. And you can do it in person or remote if you need to continue your continuity care. And we give you all those same tools, but in a really condensed, condensed time period. And they keep telling me not to say this out loud, but once we have you, we keep you. So you get to do research for as long as you want with us. And I think that that's a really valuable part of being a primary care researcher or just a medical researcher in general. So let's dive into the content for today. And I've broken this up into three different parts. The first part is historical, and we'll spend about a third of our time on that. The second part is the context of data today. And the final part is a question and dialogue where we'll talk about GME and what you all are expecting from the UVA. I don't start with the history to bore you. I start with history because context is invaluable. And if we learn from the lessons of the past, then that will help us transform GME for the future. I also think recognizing where we started as a medical community, we don't talk about that very much. We don't give time and space to history of medicine and appreciate how far we've come as an institution and as physicians, nurses, and all of the people that form our team, we've come a long way. So I'm gonna start with, with the idea of undergraduate medical education as a framework for graduate medical education. And we're gonna go back more than 100 years in history. So in the, in the mid 1800s, the American Medical Association was formed. And it was formed with the idea of purifying quackery from our profession. And I'll reframe that today. I think it's, they were promoting evidence-based medicine before they knew what evidence-based medicine was. So they wanted to purify quackery from the profession. They wanted to standardize what medical care was across the United States. And they had a very important role in public health, like sanitation, when people weren't talking about clean water, sewage and management of any pollutants in the area. So that's what the American Medical Association was built on in the mid 1800s. And by 1882, JAMA joined the picture and they're starting to disseminate their findings. They're trying to tell people about what medical education should look like. But they realized that the United States was falling far behind Europe in both our technology, our medical advancements, how we were taking care of people. And so they, did, they commissioned this guy, Abraham Flexner, to go around schools in the United States in 1901 to figure out what was happening in medical education. And so Flexner spent the next nine years traveling to medical schools all across the United States to lead this project. So what was happening at UVA concordantly to give you all pertinent context of where you are right now? Well, UVA was the 10th medical center in the United States, medical school in the United States formed by TJ. And when he thought about this back in the early 1800s, he decided that the first building would be the anatomic hall, which is on the top of this slide. And he was the one who designed it. It was completed in 1826, and it was the theater for evaluating medical sciences. Now TJ and the only one professor at UVA in 1826 knew that Charlottesville was too small to really support medical learning. And so all that was happening at UVA at the time was just theoretical, 
conceptual care. They didn't have the patient basis to really make a big improvement in, in medical learning at the time. By the late 1800s, university had promoted a 150 bed hospital and had grown their medical education. And the 150 bed hospital opened in 1901 at the exact same time that Abraham Flexner was going out on his mission to evaluate medical schools. This is an early class of, of graduates. We don't have a 1901 class of graduate picture, unfortunately. So this is just an early class of graduates. So Flexner started out in 1901, he finished in 1910, he wrote a nine page thesis, and I'm gonna make an, a narrator's comment here. I wish someone would give me nine years and nine pages to research anything. It's unheard of to have this kind of time to go out and do research, but he did. And he traveled to 151 medical schools over the course of nine years. And here is what he found. He decided that medical schools should be part of universities and that they should be located in a large city. These are the first two. The third thing is that he should only have one, uni one university and one medical school per town. So this is very much because Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia had tons and tons of medical schools, but very few patients to share among them at the time. And the fourth thing that he recommended was that you study the medicine that is pertinent to your community and your surroundings. And I'll say this is the first point at which we appreciate a social accountability and an index of that accountability to your community. Now, what he framed this as, well, if you're studying in Louisiana, in the bayou, then you should be familiar with the infectious diseases that are common there. And if you're practicing in a large urban area with a bunch of reproductive age females, well, you better be really comfortable with deliveries. And if you're up in the North England area where tuberculosis and travelers were most common, then you should be able to treat tuberculosis. So this was the first time that someone had said, hey, treat what's around you, learn what's around you and focus on that. At Flexner's time in, time in history, he recommended that of the 151 schools that he visited, only 31 remain in function. There were 300 or so at the time, but he said, we only need 31 schools. We need 2000 graduates per year and a total of 9,000 medical students at all to treat the entire country. Now let's take a break and go back in time here. So when we started this, the AMA in 1846, James Polk was president, Oregon was a territory. When this came out, um, we had moved on to McKinley, big progress in the United States as the president, but we still didn't have Hawaii as a state yet. And so the con the con the context of the time was that they didn't think they would need the number of physicians that they were producing during that era. Now, I thought it would be helpful to you all to know what Flexner said about the University of Virginia. And he does, he mentions UVA at one point during this. And he said, like was noted early in the school's mission, UVA was too small of a city for the surrounding Charlottesville, was too small of a city to support a medical education. So send them on down to Norfolk because that's where they're actually gonna be able to train and get people engaged. It took around 70 years for our medical education to become more standardized in a flexor type approach. And we're gonna talk and come back to this, but what about graduate medical education? That is what we are here to talk about today. And Flexner proposed that it was unnecessary that you learned everything you should know in medical school and then go out and treat the world because that was what should and, and did happen in communities, which we know today is probably not exactly what happens. Before Flexner started moving around the United States, training in postgraduate, so after the four years of medical school was pretty darn rare. People did do some apprenticeships, but it was hard to find. The faculty from Yale, Harvard, Michigan, Hopkins, they all went abroad to get some postgraduate training. That's what this picture is. This is Victor Sesner in Germany. And he was training American physicians to do surgeries abroad. The technology was more advanced. The surgical procedures were, were better known in Europe and the infrastructure was more in place to train individuals. So in a cool story, this, he was the first surgeon to um, perform an oncologic procedure removing esophageal cancer and the patient survived pre-anesthesia, which is crazy to me. So surgeons and other physicians would go and travel to Europe to get some training, they would come back. That was in the 1800s to the early 1900s. And these were really apprenticeships. These weren't traditional postgraduate medical education like we see with GME today. Formal residency programs, as you might know, were really established by Osler 
at Hopkins, and that's where the rounds that we traditionally think of come from. But even when these were established, it was unclear who residents were. People who worked in the hospital that were just staff could participate in residencies. People who were from the community could participate in residencies. So you didn't have to graduate from medical school to be a resident at that time. And that caused a lot of confusion in what was developing. By World War I, nearly 70% of medical school graduates went on to some sort of postgraduate training, whether it was an apprenticeship or a residency type. And the AMA said, okay, well, now we have all these people doing these graduate uh, experiences. How do we standardize that? Because medicine is a revolution and you see things come back, right? So they said, how are we going to uh, standardize this? And they proposed an essentials of residency. And it was, here are the principles we think every resident should know, but institutions, you figure out how to do this on your own. So they just gave some, some general guidance for that. Ophthalmology uh, was also developing its own board at this time. It was the first, first board. It was established in 1817. And this was the first female diplomate of the American Board of Ophthalmology, Laura Lane. She was not a resident, but she did graduate from, or she did complete their actual, uh, the tests that were established in the early 1900s. Ophthalmology was shortly followed by otolaryngology. And interestingly, primary care tried to establish their own residence or their own board in 1919, but failed to do so because Flexner said, we should be able to do this without any sub subsequent training. And so that thought was still very fresh in people's mind that we don't really need these boards, but some started to pop up. In the 1920s, residency looked a lot different than it does today. Residents were encouraged to take a very small number of patients, know everything about your patient, read a lot, spend time in the library, relax, that way all of it could matriculate and you know, sit in your brain so that you could learn it. They were not the workhorses of the hospital. They had small, small patient panels. And it looked much different than it does today. By World War II, we see a very large shift in what our graduates look like. By 1943, there were 3,000 unfilled residency positions in the United States, and that's because the supply and demand was never a model we adopted as a GME community. We just put people in residencies because they needed them there, was what they thought. So there were 3,000 unfilled residencies going into World War II, and there was no population health or attribution to the general public at this period of time. Now, at the same time, FDR comes to UVA and gives the commencement in 1940, and UVA did something really strategic in its approach to undergraduate medical education at the time. They trained two classes of medical students every year so that they could graduate and go to the, to the actual, to, to Palermo, Italy, acting as a hospital for people at war. And so they would send their graduates directly to Italy during that time period. This took away from the graduate medical education push at UVA, but certainly served a social good. And this is them returning home, the eighth evacuation hospital returning home in 1845. So now we're up to post-World War II. And like I said, medicine is cyclical. And so people recognize that there had to be some sort of standardization of residency education. How are we doing this? What are we teaching? How are we making sure that residents are safe because there had been the transformation to much higher patient loads, unsafe working conditions, how staff truly were, how staff, they lived at the hospital. And so the American Medical Association, again, commissioned a report called the Millis Report, and the newly formed AAMC commissioned a report called the Cogshall Report. And they essentially said the same thing as before. What we saw is that there should be an association of residency positions with universities. They should be close to and affiliated with universities. They also said that really an internship wasn't necessary. We shouldn't have a generalist year. We should have very specialized training and that the science of the generalist should be in medical school. The Cogshall report was also aimed at identifying the distribution and quantity of physicians in the United States based on graduate medical education, but they couldn't figure it out. So three years after their commission, they they produced their report, but could not tell us what the distribution and the specialization of physicians in the United States should be. Now, right before this, residencies weren't really affiliated with, with universities. They were just at hospitals across the nation. And those quickly dissolved, and we saw a rise in the residency placements with universities at larger hospital systems. So what was happening on this time, in this time to context contextualize what, was, what the uh, feeling of our population was? 
Well, the Vietnam War is raging. There are active bombings in Hanoi and Haiphong. So the US public is pretty outraged and critical of government initiatives in the United States. Lyndon B. Johnson is president. The civil rights movement is crescendoing at this time. And I had to put a picture on the right here that Brooks Robinson led my favorite team, the Baltimore Orioles to the World Series in 1965. One other really valuable point is that in 1965, which this is the class of at the top, also had the signing of Medicare by LBJ. And Medicare has had a substantial and longitudinal impact on the way we train residents. Medicare funded GME in 1965. This was the first time we had a federal funding source for graduate medical education. And I should pause here to say, and I should have done this at the beginning, I apologize. When I think about GME or graduate medical education, I consider anything after medical school as GME and UME being those first four to seven years when you are actually in medical school. So that's, that's the distinction here. GME was funded through Medicare beginning in 1965, and it was thought to be a social good and so the population would help pay for the training of medical residents. But Medicare funding was never intended to be training for all physicians taking care of all people. It was only intended for Medicare beneficiaries. And the thought was that by training these wonderful doctors, the patients would get the most wonderful care. So we're providing a social good, you are paying for it. You all are wonderful, fabulous physicians and you're giving the highest quality of care to those patients. At first, it was a cost-based analysis, so the hospital or residency would submit a bill to Medicare at the end of the year and say, hey, pay us for all of this. And then in the, uh, in the 80s, they moved to the direct medical education costs, the salaries of residents, and the indirect cost, the salaries of your faculty members who help teach you and keeping the lights on in the building. And that's important because it shifted how much funding was going from the federal level to residency programs. By the 1990s, Medicare was still the only insurer and only federal agency that really funded any graduate medical education in the country. So what did that look like? This is a paper by Fitzhugh Mullins Group at George Washington, and it evaluated the change in the cap of residencies over the course of the 10 years since Medicare started funding. And what we see is that there is a high distribution of residents in the Northeast. That is where most of the slots for graduate medication, medical education exist. So if we compare these GME slots to where the cap is, and that's different, we should identify a very similar area. So if we compare these back to back, what we see here is that the per population physician distribution matches up with where there are GME slots. That makes total sense. This is what we should see. If they're funding more slots in an area, there should be more slots for those people living in that, in that location. But what you should notably identify on this is that the Midwest doesn't have a high volume of residents that are available there. There was a lack of funding equity in the United States because again, that Medicare funding went to the places that already had residencies, and those residencies had left the communities and went to university centers. And so that's what was getting funded um, from 1996 onwards. A myth that I oftentimes hear about Medicare funding is that we haven't been able to expand any of our graduate medical education after Medicare capped, and that's not correct. So the Medicare cap said that the slots that existed were the only slots around. The funding could increase because inflation, so you get more money now than you did in 1996 for a, re for a resident, but the slots didn't increase. The slots could increase at hospitals that had never had a graduate medical education program. So naive hospitals, if they wanted to start one, they could apply for Medicare funding. They had five years to build a residency. And at the end of five years, they submitted their cost reports and that is what they would get back. So you do see new residency programs pop up in the course of 1996 to 2010 and even till now. The other big initiative that was taken on by CMS, Medicare, was teaching health centers. And teaching health centers have a specific legislation that is every two years and every residency program director, director should be sweating because two years of funding does not have long enough funding to actually produce residents. But TH, uh, TCH legislature, says that they have two years of funding to produce residencies in these additional sites. Now, why does that matter? It matters because residencies did grow. We didn't have a stationary, these are the only residents 
from 1996 onwards, we had about a 10%, maybe 17% growth if we are including all the Medicaid spots and private hospital slots like HCA. Graduate medical education is important, and I don't think I have to convince anybody in this room that that's the case. But what we see are five specific areas that I would like you all to consider and focus on. First off is that there's a geographic impact of where residents are trained. We find that the 70 over 70% 70 of residents stay within 100 miles of where they train. Now that 100 miles is nothing in New York, but it's a lot in Oklahoma. So 100 miles can make a big difference. For teaching health centers, those graduates stay within five miles and teaching health centers are exclusively in medically underserved areas. So that has a giant impact on the community that it serves. Imprinting is a fascinating event that if you as a resident train in a low cost setting, you go on to provide low cost care for at least 10 years, if not 15 years after you graduate from residency and vice versa. If you practice in residency in a high cost setting, you go on to provide very high cost care after you leave residency. Physician recruitment and, and retainment is a fascinating uh, GME initiative, and that is for community involvement, we want to bring in the people who live in that area to train at that medical school and go to that residency so they stay in that area. So the more involved a GME program is within their community, the more likely they are to have their residents stay in that area. I hope that I could say to all of you that you are experts in care. Residents are at the peak of their knowledge right at graduation or one year after in their fellowship year. And the goal is that we provide that critical level of care to our patients moving forward. And the final is that GME has a big financial impact, whether you realize this or not. When an attending physician leaves their residency program and is their first year, they bring about 2.2 million in revenue to the community that they serve. And they bring in 12 additional slots for people to work in that, 12 to 14 additional slots to work in that area. So it has a very large economic impact as well. And this is where we start to think about, well, there is social accountability of graduate medical education. It's not just go train somewhere and then go provide care wherever. Where you train is where you stay. Where you train is where you make money. Where you make money is where you spend money. And where you spend money is the community around you. And we should be caring for that community around us and addressing their needs. And I'll reflect back here to Flexner's fourth point. He said, learn about the conditions that are most prevalent in your community. And that's changed a little bit, right? We should all probably know how to treat tuberculosis. And we should all probably know how to handle an acute MI. But there is this element of making sure that we are trained to the pertinence of the surrounding community. So what about graduate medical education shortages? This is the American Medical Association's uh, graphic of shortages expected by 2034. And if I were a statistician looking at this, it would give me great angst because that confidence interval is huge. We have either a 37,000 or 124,000 doctor shortage by 2034. What do you make of that? That's just crazy to say that we have this broad spectrum of possible um, possible shortages coming by 2034. Let's break it down a little bit. So I'm a primary care researcher. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about primary care. So primary care starting in 2010, we had about 220 doctors across the United States. And our analysis evaluated that there, or decided that there were three effects that how, would have the greatest impact on physician shortages in the next 15 years. And those three things were population growth, for aging, so people are getting sicker and more complex and requiring more care in their older years. And the ACA had a pretty large effect on people's ability to access care. So based on those three principles, we see that by 2025, the need would be over 260,000. So a 40,000-ish number of shortage by 2025 if we maintained those GME levels and didn't expand graduate medical education. And what this doesn't take into account whatsoever is retirement. I know that doctors of two generations above me are practicing well into their 70s. And maybe that won't be the case for my generation and the generation right above me. So we're going to see a retirement increase and that will impact these shortages as well. And if you don't believe me or the Robert Graham Center that we're gonna have around 40,000 people shortages, here's estimates from the AMA. And they're around the same. We see that 
20,000 to 48,000 shortage in the United States. So it's a very real shortage that we will face in the next 10 years. I think it's helpful to, to drill down even a little bit more and look at Virginia specifically. So this is the Virginia workforce estimates. I'll, uh, I'll say here, always be wary of data. So I'm showing you different scales here. And this baseline is starting off with the assumption that in 2010, we had zero physician shortage. But we know that's not true. We know that in 2010, there was a physician shortage. But let's just make the assumption that in 2010, there was no physician shortage. We're taking into account those three variables that I talked about before. And we see that by 2030, we will need an additional 1,600 family physicians, primary care, sorry, primary care physicians to fill the need of Virginians. We started off at that 2010 level with 5,500 primary care physicians in the state. So we had essentially 50, uh, 20 years to figure out how to get to that additional 1,600 and how did we do? Last year, uh, my team at VCU and I did an analysis that looked at all of primary care in Virginia with the most recent data available, and that leads us up to 2019. And here's what we looked at. We counted everybody that was a family medicine doc as providing primary care, and I will admit that's probably not true. Not every family medicine doc does all of prim does primary care. We included general internal medicine, general pediatrics, gynecologists that it had at least some element of well women exams as primary care physicians. And we even included specialists in their communities that were providing primary care. And how did we do that? Well, we matched clinicians with their NPI number, no worries about the background, but then we looked at their codes and we saw what they were actually doing in clinical settings. And we saw if they were doing well child checks, we saw if they were doing well adult exams, we saw if they were giving vaccines in their clinic. And a great example of these specialists, that small cohort, is a cardiologist in Withville, Virginia, who does well adult checks on a bunch of his patients, gives vaccine, sees people for the cold, because there's no primary care doc close to him. So that cardiologist in his community is functioning as a primary care clinician. So we included them into these estimates, and the total number in 2019 was 5,900. So after 10 years from our prior shortage, we have only grown by 400 clinicians which leaves us 1,200 short in the next 10 years. And I don't know where those clinicians are coming from. Specialists, I did not forget about you. We see that the shortage for specialist clinicians is slightly lower. We anticipate between 4,000 and 13,000 uh, specialist shortages in the next 15 years. And I say that I would propose to you that that scale is really darn important. And I hear a lot of people say to me, well, why family medicine? One physician said to me, you're too smart for family medicine. Why would you do that? Why is primary care important? And I'll tell you exactly why primary care is important. In the last two years, the National Academies of Medicine, Engineering, uh, and Science have released two reports that are high profile and they are both centered on primary care. And what they found was that primary, let me back up. Do we all agree that the National Academy of Medicine is probably expert in the field of medicine? Can we agree on that premise? So if we agree on the premise that these are experts in their field and not just primary care physicians, they're physicians of all types of specialties. In their 2021 report implementing high quality primary care, they said that primary care is the only specialty to have evidence that demonstrates improved health outcomes and reduced health disparities. And that to me says primary care is important, 100%. In this report, they also rate how we're doing as a country, and they give five proposals on things that we can do to improve our primary care standing in the nation. It includes funding for research, graduate medical education, workforce access, digital health and technology. And in response to these five recommendations, the Robert Graham Center and Millbank put together a scorecard, and you all are getting a sneak peek because this is released at two o'clock today. So if any of you tweet this at me, I'm gonna deny that we even talked about it. But we're gonna go through what these report cards or scorecard look like for those five different areas that we addressed. We're gonna focus on training today and that has a direct impact on access and workforce. We're not going to look so much at the abysmal 0.2% of NIH funding that goes to primary care or the financing scores. But if you wanna wonk out 
and talk about the $4.3 trillion we spend on healthcare come up, come afterwards and let's like talk about all the spend because that's super valuable too. So this is what we found in 2020. This is the most recent data that we have available to us. Here is where medical residents are trained and their proportions per 100,000 people in each state. Does this map look familiar to you? It should. It's eidetic to the map from 15 years ago. We haven't seen any changes in the distribution of where medical residents are. And that translates exactly to what we saw before of where they stay. So this is the map of attending physicians per 10,000 people, 100,000 people in the population after they have graduated from residency. And you can easily note that Northeast is where people have concentrated. It's where they trained, it's where they stayed. I would propose to you that this map shows me that healthcare is a bi-coastal privilege. The people that live in the center of the United States do not have equitable access to care in general. Let's look at where people are entering primary care and this looks eerily different. So we see that states that have more rural and medically underserved areas have a higher number of physicians that graduate from medical school and enter in the primary care field. And this is the number of medical residents that are trained in medically underserved areas or rural counties. And this is for all residencies, not just primary care, but for any residencies. And as I would hope, we see that areas that would likely have more medically underserved areas have more residents training in those areas. Why do you care? This is an important, important reasonable question. If you've never seen the Ecology of Medical Care by Kerr White, this is his box proposal. This was in 1961. And it matters to you, UVA, because Kerr White retired in Charlottesville and he donated his entire medical library to the Claude Moore Library, where the original text of this lives, which is pretty darn cool. So this came from 1961. And he did research that established where patients go to get their care. So if I have a thousand patients in my panel who are all at risk for diabetes, 750 of them will have some complications, some need during the month about their diabetes. 250 will come see me in clinical care. Nine of them are admitted to the hospital. Five are going to be referred somewhere else. And only one is gonna end up with you, UVA. Everything else is gonna stay with me or my community hospital. And so it matters where these medically underserved areas are because that's where the most, the majority of patients end up staying is in their communities, not in the center of where academic medicine has been hosted previously. So let's conclude on the social accountability of training. When I think about the ways that we should propose changes for graduate medical education moving forward, which has not moved, I just showed you, the map's exactly the same, we haven't moved the needle. So if we're looking at changes for the future and how we can allocate the next 1,000 positions that Congress just allowed for medical expansion of graduate medical education, here's what I would promote. Those slots need to be equitably accessed across the United States. We need to focus on the areas that have not had training in the past. We need to collaborate with our communities, with our local governments, and with public health to figure out what the disparities are in those areas. And this moves back to Flexner's fourth point. Let's figure out what matters to the community, what matters to the people. Let's take the community needs assessment that every university and hospital does and actually use it rather than putting it on a shelf. We should financially incentivize places that do training in place to actually do it. Money speaks. I can talk to you all day, but if you don't put money to back it up, it's not gonna happen. And then we should make sure that we are recruiting physicians, medical assistants, nurses, administrators, from communities. Every place that serves should look like, their medical professionals should look like them. And we have failed as a community to do this so far. My caveat to the final incentive is that it would be really hard for a neuroimmunologist to go out to a rural community and have enough patients to actually train in that community. So there are caveats. This is not for every single specialty, but by and large, training in place should be financially incentivized. Now, do I propose to you that we break down the ivory towers and everybody leaves this institution and no one trains at UVA anymore? Of course not. That's not practical or reasonable. But what I do think we could propose is that when you're a resident, go out and train somewhere in an underserved community for a short period of time. Trade the education that you have with people in communities that you don't normally touch. When we expand medical education, Let's do so with rural training tracks. 
let's emphasize teaching health centers in our community so that we move the power of the ivory tower to the communities where it's needed the most. That's what I would propose for you all. And I, I really look forward to your questions and dialogue. I think we'll have a productive conversation. So thank you all. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Hustler. Um, uh, we'd like to entertain questions. Um, we'll have questions from the audience and uh, have questions from the Zoom audience as well. Um, and afterwards, uh, we're also going to have an opportunity for people to meet with Dr. Hustler in the um, meeting room one. So. If you don't get your question answered here, there will be more opportunities. Um, uh, if people would like to submit questions in the chat, I will moderate those. Um, and if you would like to ask a question here, please raise your hand and we'll get you a microphone. And while uh, you're thinking about that, I'm just going to go ahead and start with a question. Um, and, and that is, you know, I think that we've talked a lot about primary care, but all of us um, whether primary care doctors or specialists, I think, have, have felt the imbalance of resources. And when we've had challenges getting patients, a primary care doctor or a specialty doctor, um, we felt like, gosh, this person really should um, see a mental health provider that has more resources than I do, um, or uh, this, this person shouldn't be driving four hours to see me for primary care. Um, how do we as individual providers and or as a school of medicine have an impact on affecting that imbalance? It's a great question, and I, I face this with patients all the time who drive maybe not four hours. I'm not I'm no Evan apparently, but uh, drive a little bit of a ways to come see me. And I think it's different for those two groups. And as a medical school, part of it is placing people in communities to train. So when we remove educational opportunities from small and independent practices, we remove those experiences as opportunities for the future. So part of it is making sure that training in place still happens at some level at any time. As a clinician yourself, I think that there is a level of trust that we have to promote back to our outside hospital. How many times as a resident did I write patient from outside hospital and I thought I looked down on it from Bath County Hospital, but that was wrong of me to do. And, and so for the patients that are traveling four hours, they might have a primary care clinician that's closer to them, but they don't trust them because a society we have not placed a good emphasis on trust in our community physicians. And so part of it is just increasing that dialogue about trusting our community physicians. But you raise a good point about mental health. We have shortages. And so um, I don't have a great answer for the mental health dilemma of today. And I, I, I would be gracious if someone did have that answer for us all. Hey, Allison. Uh, great talk. Thank you. And um, I was wondering if you could comment on the way that UVA might be able to use the recent community health acquisition of hospitals leading up into Northern Virginia as part of a strategy to have some more community training opportunities for our residents and potentially specialists as well. Sure. I'm not super familiar with all of the acquisitions, but I think it's like Haymarket sort of area and those hospitals. Uh, Hay Haymarket, uh, Winchester, and Culpeper, I think. And Prince oh, yeah. William. Thank you. So it seems like that's actually ripe for opportunity to send residents there, to send medical students there, to think about ways to collaborate with, with clinicians who don't work directly at the hospitals themselves to be collaborators. Um, when I think about Haymarket Hospital, I, I hope I'm not giving away any secrets, Dr. G. But when I think about Haymarket Hospital back when I was a resident, they didn't want to have people come rotate with them because they didn't want to cap their own Medicare funding at the time. And so to, to think that they are now able to take residents and build some of that capacity in, I, I think it makes great sense. There, there is um, a level of educational diligence that has to happen. So not every doc is a teacher. And I think that's fine. Not every person who graduates from medical school has to be a teacher, but finding the people in those communities that can be educators, whether it be nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, MAs, opportunities arise from every level of community health. Uh, 
All right. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really enlightening. I uh, really appreciated your time. Uh, my question is that, uh, do you think that the funding for centers of excellence to pipeline young members of a community into medical school, be it a geographic community or ethnic community, do you think that there is a lack of funding or do you think it's more of a resource allocation within HHS that might be contributing to the problem? That's a wonderful, a wonderful question. So there are several different recruitment strategies. And I, I will caveat and say, I was told not to use pipeline anymore because it can be offensive to a specific uh, demographic. And so I use recruitment now as my steadfast word. So the recruitment pathway for students that have historically been underrepresented or, or communities that have been underrepresented, we actually have a lot of initiatives from organizations, not from government entities to do that. So things like HOSA, which is an uh, a high school organization that reaches out to students who are interested in STEM in general and offers them opportunities to work with clinicians, to meet with people in the area who have excelled in any medicine, medical specialty. And I think that those are quite valuable. I do not foresee the federal government funding recruitment strategies at this time. I think HHS is focused very much away from population health and and increasing recruitment efforts right now. Dr. Huffstetler, we have a question in the chat. Um, uh, the respondent says, are you an advocate for a national health service where everyone who graduates from a residency provides health care to communities in need? Uh, this is like the Australia model is what I'll say is the closest to that. So. Um, many physicians who train in Australia or international medical graduates who come into Australia to practice have to do a two-year remote location before they enter into a city uh, to do their practice. But actually what we find is that with, at least with primary care in those locations, the individuals who go out to remote, uh, remote towns in Australia stay. They don't leave those towns. They don't go to the urban areas. They made their community and that's where they stay. So would I propose that for the United States? No way. We are way too against the idea that we have to serve. I mean, if you think about even military enrollment now, I just I think that there would be way too much pushback from our mental perception of what it means to have to be told to go somewhere. That being said, the National Health Service Corps does a really brilliant job at that. So the National Health Service Corps has done 70% uh, of, your, of your time, your clinical time has to be dedicated to an area that has a high HIPSA, health professional shortage area score. And those uh, institutions have really brought doctors to communities in need. Since you mentioned uh, Australia, one of our previous Brody scholars, uh, Dr. Paul Worley, who is the Dean of Flinders University, developed a program where communities actually recruited the people that they wanted to be their doctors and trained them in situ as medical students mm -hmm. um, and had tremendous retention rates there. Yep. Is that something that would help the United States healthcare situation? I would posit yes. And I, I would agree that Australia has done this. And if you go back in time and look at Jack Geiger's work who went to community health centers or it was called COPCs, the Community Outpatient Primary Care in South Africa, he did the same thing where they brought the community needs, they identified individuals who were interested in becoming physicians and nurses in those communities, and that's where they stayed and trained. And they had to go away for some periods to have clinical exposure, but they went back and they did most of their education in their own hometowns. And that became really what the community health centers of today were framed on through HRSA. Now they look much different than they did in the 60s when, when Jack Geiger was coming back and forth. But that was that premise was why the Health Resources and Services Administration was really started. I, had, I had a different question originally, but just to follow up on Sam, on your discussion with Sam here about there are opportunities for teaching. Not every physician is a teacher and teaching is undervalued. Teaching is, is markedly undervalued in the health system. I mean, the, the national healthcare system. Um, and so I think that's a kind of a bigger national discussion. But um, my other question was, you know, you showed the figure of, <clears throat> 
the number of medical students entering training in certain areas and how that was discordant with other um, like concentrations of, of people in need in communities. Do you think that that reflects kind of like a catching up in some of those areas that had been kind of historically like had received less funding and, and that sort of thing? It's an interesting question about catching up in an area of need. And I, I don't know that answer. When we look at the the map that I think you're referencing is the number of um, medical school graduates entering primary care and the density was much different than those with the with the states that had the highest training. And that was calculated on medical school graduates who matched into family medicine, internal medicine, and pediatrics, which we know are not all going to be general clinicians, they might subspecialize thereafter. Um, but I suspect that's actually just a factor of the schools and those areas promoting those specialties. I don't think it's catch up so much as it is the identity of many newer colleges and focus on generalism. Awesome, yeah, awesome talk, thank you. Um, I guess I was just wondering, yeah, the map sort of staggering and it's staggering to see it. it hasn't changed. I wonder what you think the role of telemedicine might be as we've seen just a revolution with that over two years and what that's done at least for the Virginia community, if that's something that could be applied nationally. And if that maybe is impractical as a side is the role of nurse practitioners and PAs to also fill those roles. Both are, are wonderful ideas. Telehealth, I think, I'm so glad you asked because when I think about the beginning of the pandemic, I worked in my ICU for two weeks. And as much as I tried to remember Dr. Enfield and Dr. Vranek's teaching on ventilators, I did not know anything about how to manage a ventilator. So I used my EICU as my way of making sure my patients were safe during those first critical weeks when I didn't really know what I was doing very well. Um, so do I think that the infrastructure could be translated into a training? I'll, I'll translate your question a bit, but could that become a training avenue? Yes, absolutely. Could we use telehealth and this advent of technology to improve training in place, but access to the resources that UVA has 100%. So let's not only use telehealth, let's use technology for training and bring those communities that have, that could potentially have learners in it and connect them with resources like this. And that would be the use of the ivory tower in a really community-based way. As for nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, yes. We, when I wear my AAFP badge, I have a different narrative than when I wear my human badge, right? And I think that family physicians and societies have this negative perception of nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, and that's not the case. They can help fill a gap. Now, is there a different education that goes to nurse practitioners and physician's assistants? Yes. Is there a limitation of what they should be able to practice autonomy? Yes, but can they help make sure that there is a connection and that they have resources in an area? 100%. Oh. Uh, my question is that as a state, doesn't look like we've done a good job keeping up with primary care providers um, with like the surplus, no, that's the deficit that we're gonna have. Are there any states that have done a good job at keeping up with that deficit? And if so, why? Uh, I will use that there are two case studies that we could look at of keeping up with primary care very well. And, and Oregon is one. And that is because Oregon has infrastructure to both pay residents um, and repay their medical student debt for those that enter primary care and family yeah. medicine specifically. And they also promote a lot of what, I don't know what they call it anymore. It's like adventure medicine. So they get to do full scope and they maintain full scope and they go out to frontier sites where they are the doctor that is maintaining their, their whole community. So I think that because they are entrusted with such a high level of care, they've been quite successful. And the other is um, um, Wisconsin. Wisconsin has some areas that have allowed for National Health Service Corps to have a little flexibility in their programs. They also have a lot of incentives to bring people into rural communities. And I will be very honest, money speaks, right? If you pay people, they kind of come. Dr. Hufstetler, thank you so much for taking the time to come to see us again today. You mentioned Dr. Mullen. 
Dr. Mullen really tried to flip the script a little bit and really upset the academic village when he published his US News and World Rankings with a different algorithm that showed this mission that you're talking about and all the um, institutions that seem to be at the top were suddenly at the bottom. Tell me, it's always a confounding to me coming from the sort of advocacy background that why is it still that the Fed seem hesitant to attach strings to that mission with the GME dollars? I mean, everything else seems to come with appropriately a fair amount of, right, you know, yeah. oversight. Um, so Dr. Mullen didn't exactly succeed in the academics because I think institutions are still pulling GME dollars that meet their resource needs. So what, what's still standing in the way of federal oversight to get those dollars going toward mission? Thank you for the question, Dr. Reed. Uh, I, I think that there are a few different factors that really play into the way that GME dollars are allocated and the way that those rankings take place, which do have, you know, you, you don't necessarily believe that something like news, the news reporting and that a ranking system would have a big impact on feds, but it does. These federal and the legislators don't know what health is. And so if we as a society that is healthcare believe that health is a social good, then we have to demonstrate that in the news and world report rankings, or we have to say that social accountability is important because the people making the laws don't know. They do not have the exposure that the people in this room do. So the hesitancy comes from a different, a couple of different things I, I, I would suggest. The first is that there's a lot of push around personalization of medicine, personalized medicine and genomics, and that being the forefront of medicine, which very much, much overlooks population health. And that's where primary care lies. So I think that there is a push in a different trajectory from the national institutes, which have, which have a big impact on the GME funding conversation. The other is that there is still a game of who you know. And so players, larger institutions that have been players in the game for a long time still have sway. And so if they say these are the specialists that are important, then that's what they hear. So can I go back to Evan's comment of what can you do? Well, you start talking to people and making friends and joining your organizations and associations. And, and those little touches make a really big difference. And I think that that's a, a valuable effort and time for each of you to spend to talk about what healthcare means to you and why not healthcare being a social good, but health should be a social good. I think we've run out of time. I feel like there are lots of questions still to ask, um, but the Bernie Committee would like to um, recognize your stirring uh, with the Bernie spoon of your own. Um, thank you for stirring in the past and for future stirring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, just real quickly and, and, and thank you, uh, Dr. Hofstetler for that wonderful talk. Feel free to drop by outside for those who are here. Uh, we will continue our conversation. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll have our own Dominique Tobel giving a talk on her new book, uh, Dr. Nurse, Science, Politics, and the Transformation of American Nursing. That is on March 15th. So uh, join us for Medical Center Hour then. Thanks everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.